Um, good, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, everyone. My name is Osman el -Dadiri. I'm the chair of FORCE 2021 conference. On behalf of myself and the entire organizing committee, I'd like to welcome you to FORCE 2021 conference. Uh, FORCE 2021 was supposedly um, to be held in San Sebastian, Spain last year, but due to COVID-19 travel restrictions and health situation, we have decided to move the conference to be virtual this year. Uh, the organizing committee had put a tremendous work in making sure that this conference is as accessible as possible. So you would notice that we have speakers from, from different backgrounds and different geographical locations. And also the program schedule has been uh, spread it around multiple time zones to allow more people to join. Uh, the conference is free of charge, thanks to our sponsors. Um, I would like to list a few of them right now. Um, ISSN, Crossref, Curve Note, Dryad, eLive, PLOS, Taylor & Francis, Rio Journal, Figshare, uh, Frontiers, Our Research, Ex Libris, USACO, and Giga Science Press. Uh, thanks to our sponsors for making sure that this conference remains uh, free of charge to allow more participants to join from around the world. Uh, the organizing committee come from also different places. So you would see a diversity of backgrounds, diversity of topics in this conference. The conference has been scheduled to, to accommodate as much uh, community participation as well. So part of the, part of the program that you will see is that community presentations, either lightning talks or poster presentations. Uh, you can connect with other attendees through Slack or you can e directly email or tweet uh, the speakers or the other attendees. Um, I would like to hand it back to the moderators for our opening keynote uh, by Leslie Chan. So, uh, thank you, Osman. It's my great privilege to introduce uh, Leslie Chan. Um, this is just his uh, small bio. Leslie Chan is Associate Professor in Department of Global Development Studies at University of Toronto. And he is also director of Knowledge Equality Lab. Uh, Leslie's teaching professional interest centers, uh, geopolitics and open knowledge uh, production and circulation, and a focus on how networking technologies are enabling new form of open collaboration, uh, critical pedagogic practices, while also amplifying and reproducing embedded power relation and inequity uh, in academy and beyond. In particularly, Leslie is exploring a dynamic university community partnership and the meaning around the knowledge co uh, cooperation, particularly research and how community engage modes in knowledge production and uh, could contribute to the equitable frameworks and uh, valuing diverse knowledge since 2000. Leslie has uh, served as a director of uh, BioLean International and open access platform for scientific journals from Global South. Uh, he is on advisory board of a number of organization, including San Francisco Declaration, of research assessment, that is DORA, director of open access journals, DOAJ, and steering committee member, open infrastructure. Additionally, Leslie was a member of 411 board from January 2016 to uh, December 2020. So thank you, Leslie. We are really happy that you are here opening, giving, uh, opening key, uh, keynote, and a lot of people are excited to listen from you. So now it's handed over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Vishali. Uh, I see Mona just managed to make it in. Uh, I was also uh, stumbling a little bit with this Zoom setup, even after two years of this uh, online gathering. Um, okay, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee of Force 11 uh, 2021 <laughs> uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, uh, as many of you uh, uh, are similar to my situation, you know, we've been online for a long time now. Uh, and I think we're all quite, quite tired and fatigued aside from everything else. Um, and this format is, again, not the most conducive to, um, I guess, uh, dialogues and so forth. And so I'll do my best in terms of getting my message across, but I, I want to preface that. Uh, this is one that I, I confess that I, I struggle a great deal 
partly because of the time right now is five in the morning for me. But again, it's the it's the two years of this uh, of this online talking to myself primarily uh, that I I'm not sure uh, most of the time whether I'm making any sense. Uh, and so uh, and this is also uh, given the topic is a very difficult one, one that I struggle with. Uh, and uh, this topic um, is something that everyone is grappling with these days in institution. Uh, and I want to preface up by also saying that uh, we're all uh, on a different path and different stages of our individual journeys of understanding equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, and structural racism within our institution. Uh, and there is no one uh, understanding uh, across institutions or all our institutions, our contexts are different. Uh, and we struggle with similar, but also distinct issues in our own context. Uh, and, and of course, each of us have our own experiences, either personally or through professional encounters. And so I just wanna uh, preface by saying that uh, my experiences may not be yours, but I hope some of my experiences would be uh, uh, relevant to, to our broader understanding of how to address uh, uh, institutional barriers and structural racism uh, across the spectrum. So let me start by sharing my screen and someone's gonna have to give me a thumbs up if I'm showing my screen, just the full screen, not the presenter's view, right? Okay, right. great. Um, thank you. So uh, I am going to keep my eye on my clock, but uh, uh, someone could also ping me five minutes before the before I supposed to stop because I do have a tendency to draw on. Uh, so this is the title that I have selected. I'm sure many of you who attended would have seen the title. So I will go through this uh, 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 what I mean uh, through through this talk. Now. Um, uh, Osman had mentioned a little bit about Force 11, and in the introduction, uh, it was mentioned that I was a, a board member of Force uh, for a few years as well. Uh, and uh, also, I was involved with the original uh, DASTU conference that gave rise to the name Force 11. Uh, and, and I was also contributed to the Force 11 uh, white paper, the manifesto that became the foundation of Force 11. Um, at the time, there was a lot of interesting discussion about really how to, uh, you know, transform scholarly, communica scholarly communication, research communications, using uh, the technologies in a better way, you know, through semantic technology, linked data and uh, open, uh, different open protocols and data sharing and so forth. All these are very important uh, issues that could, you know, change the way we think about scholarly communications. Uh, but looking back, we really haven't paid much attention to issue uh, of uh, equities and diversity, and particularly about structural barriers within our scholarly communication system, uh, particularly from a global perspective. And so, so in a way, I'm trying to make up for some of these oversight, if you will, but the important ones uh, in this manifesto, uh, uh, as I'm as I'm still learning uh, and finding my way through some of these challenges. Um, so. There are a number of main points I'd like to go through. Uh, that is uh, that in order to understand contemporary inequity in knowledge production and communication, uh, research communication, we really have to understand history and history does matter. And some of you might balk at the idea that colonialism and, and, and the, the nature of how science developed in the imperial period, uh, colonial period, still have impact today, but they do. Uh, and I will try to convince you some of those that are still embedded in our system. And unless we really make them visible and address them directly, uh, they will continue to structure the way the institution functions and continue to structure uh, inequity. 
Uh, and so in that regard, if we simply address the kind of compositional diversity, adding people in here or there into this or that, bring them to the table or here or there, uh, these are mostly service performative actions, as many of us know, uh, and they don't really address real uh, structural uh, and systemic uh, issues. And so we really have to get at some of these issues and, and get at the roots, so to speak. Uh, and one of the root problem of structural racism is that it is about the maintenance uh, and reproduction of power and the status quo. And there are lots of people in that, that, that like to maintain those status quo and they can find ways to maintain this institutional power with new language and with new new I, a new new way of doing things, but they're in fact same old principles of, of inequities, but in new new kind of uh, bottles, if you will. And so uh, I would say that a lot of rhetoric and discourse about openness uh, is falling into this uh, fall into this category of new language, but old practices. That is. Uh, reproducing and amplifying ex existing inequality. So it is very important that we also critically uh, uh, look at some of these rhetorics about openness uh, and how it's supposed to be uh, good for everyone. So it is not an unquestioned good for uh, everyone all the time. So we need to uh, be a bit more cont uh, contextualizing what we mean by, by open in different uh, situation. Uh, and I'd like to conclude uh, with, with suggesting that we really re need to rethink uh, not just the technology, uh, technologies obviously played a big part, but the technology can and re do reproduce uh, inequality. So it is important that we think about design from the ground up. How do we center uh, human relations and solidarity as the basics uh, principles in, when we're designing system of, of science and communications. Uh, and through all my talk, I will try to, to illustrate why centering humans rather than, than technology is, is so important. So let me begin with the first tab point that I was uh, trying uh, that I try to make about have knowledge and equity having deep historical roots. And so this is a, a map that I often refer to. And in fact, I have a poster of this that I stick it on my office wall just to remind me about this issues that I've been trying to understand for the past 20 years. And this map uh, shows you the world according to citation counts uh, and based on data from uh, at the time, the Web of Science in early 2000. Um, and a lot have changed since then, but I think uh, this, this map tells a story. Uh, there are actually tells quite a number of stories, and I will tell a, a few of them. Uh, the common stories of this map is that, well, if you look at this through citation metrics, the world is obviously quite uneven. Uh, the whole, uh, this is the purple part on the top here is Europe. Uh, and the UK here over here is very prominent. The US of course is very prominent, but the entire continent of Africa here, uh, a, co a colleague of mine referred to like a pencil uh, is almost completely invisible uh, according, if you were to map the world according to the number of citation relative to its populations and, and, and geography. And so the question is, is this a good representation of the world of knowledge production. And obviously one would really have serious doubt about uh, uh, how this particular set of lenses uh, distorts the world uh, in a very, very uh, uh, severe way. Uh, and so uh, for years I have, think about, I have been thinking about this through, uh, again, uh, this kind of lenses go, then uh, how can we address this kind of inequities I've been thinking? Uh, and can open science and open access, the kind of uh, 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 broadening of participation and access, change this kind of global system of uh, asymmetry and power differential? Uh, and could openness, the network 
connections, a kind of uh, a different uh, way of working together, create new spaces and collaboration, uh, uh, leading to different kinds of community organizations uh, and thinking of knowledge uh, as a commons. Uh, and so, so, so these kind of questions I've been trying to to, to work through through different research projects and different uh, experiments. Um, but over the years, I realized more and more that we cannot think about these questions without situation situating these issues in history uh, and political context, because these are not simply technical issues that can be solved through technical means. Uh, and the more I try to understand these, the more I realize that uh, in fact, most of those technical decisions are, are uh, have a lot of political uh, uh, decision embedded in them, but they're often invisible. Uh, and these are invisible uh, uh, encoded uh, uh, rules uh, are the one that still keep the power structures very, very uneven. Uh, and without addressing these, these hidden rules, uh, we will always be uh, stuck in this uh, inequity. There is this uh, visual uh, uh, representation of uh, what uh, a geographer uh, Passy have uh, shown, what he called the wheel of power, right? and and by he this 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 wheel of power was uh, uh, provided in the context of. Uh, of the work he's been doing on academic capitalism and the geopolitics of knowledge. And this diagram nicely uh, outlines many of the issues that we confront in our contemporary uh, institution, higher education, uh, both in the North and in the South. And you'll see that there are many of these things that we're familiar with, you know, the, the, the centering of uh, Anglophone um, uh, um, system of knowledge, uh, particularly enforced by the publishing uh, complex. Um, and these things are then reinforced by things like university ranking uh, with different kinds of metrics that we're only too familiar with. Uh, and of course, with all kinds of discourse about efficiencies, about, about, uh, uh, about investments and return on investments and about rising in, uh, in the global scales and become world-class and so forth. Uh, and these kind of rhetorics have helped reinforce particular notions of knowledge productions. And of course, uh, it has been evolving in recent years into a complex system of surveillance publishings and extractions uh, through data and new kinds of analytics. These are now very lucrative business that many of the big publishers have actually moved towards. Uh, it's not just about publishing anymore, it's really about uh, uh, enclosing uh, our entire system of knowledge sharing and production. Uh, and so uh, this circle of power, this wheel of power, uh, again, is not, uh, is not something new, but again, have deep historical roots. What we see, some of the things may look new, but it's histories. Uh, they have deep history, uh, um, as we can see. Uh, one way to look at this history is look at, again, university ranking. Uh, again, if you map where the location of the top 50 universities, uh, according to the time higher education ranking, uh, you will see that not surprisingly, they are overwhelmingly located in Europe and in, in the US uh, and some in, in Canada as well. And, and if you look at these, these, uh, these ranking, uh, again, what is obvious is that uh, the concentration uh, of where these universities are uh, has clear historical uh, path uh, to, to, again, uh, a history of who dominated during the colonial period. And uh, Professor uh, Hazelcorn, who has been studying university rankings for many years, have this to say about um, university ranking. And she said, essentially, uh, ranking measure the outcome of historical competitive advantage. An elite university and nations benefit from 
he's accumulated public wealth and investment over decades, if not centuries. And so they also uh, attract wealthy students that have either achievement and graduate on time and have successful careers. These all feed back into the reputation uh, but of the university, but these reputation uh, are easily conflated with quality because reputation takes time to develop. And this easy conflation obviously advantages all established institutions, which also, again, um, uh, reinforces uh, the, their, their, their place uh, in terms of defining uh, uh, where knowledge is reside. And so looking back at this map again, uh, this map not only uh, uh, shows the world through citation uh, counts, but this map actually reflects the legacy of colonialism and racism in terms of how certain countries have systemically underdeveloped uh, other countries through control of the knowledge production system. Uh, and so if we want to address uh, the underlying problem, we have to go beyond uh, composition of diversity and look at what the, how these structural inequity are rooted in history. Um, now, what was interesting, uh, last year, uh, after the George Floyd killing uh, by a policeman in the US, uh, of course, there had been a lot of soul searching uh, in the US, but also around the world. Uh, and Black Lives Matter is something that institutions um, in, in North America and some, and some part of Europe have been grappling with. And what was interesting was that last year in Nature, uh, the publishing house put out this tweet uh, that they recognize nature is one of the white institutions that is responsible for bias in research and scholarship. And they said they are committed to working to, work, to, working to end anti-Black practices in research. Uh, and they have a longer editorial and you can go read it up on your own. Uh, and so I've been very interested in looking at what they are doing in terms of, of, of uh, honoring what they said about uh, uh, addressing anti-Black racism and another form of uh, racism within, uh, within their, their institution. Now, Nature, of course, is one of the oldest journals, of course, one of the most well-known journal uh, uh, in the world, uh, and it's been around since 1869. Uh, and if you were to ask me, you know, how to think about uh, the kind of structural problem within uh, this institution, which it admits to be uh, racist and biased, uh, one obvious thing is to look at the editors in chief and the tenure over the years. These are all uh, white males, uh, and some of them have the first, the, the founder of the journal uh, actually uh, held the reign as editor in chief for 50 years. And then on down the line, uh, there's been uh, only a handful of, of editor in chiefs with this very, very powerful institution. Uh, it's only in, in very recent years that we've seen a woman uh, editor, co editor in chief. Uh, and uh, so the kind of compositions that we see here uh, may be. Is, is not uncommon, not just for nature, but across many different uh, well-established journals uh, and editorial board. And this is an issue that's now becoming increasingly uh, addressed. But again, composition alone doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, in this book about the history of the journal Nature, um, Melinda, Melinda Baldwin have documented how powerful this institution is in terms of not just simply recording and, and, and bestowing reputation on, on publications and scientists, but the journal itself actually actively played a role in defining what science is and how, who, what it means to be a scientist and who qualifies to be a scientist. Uh, and uh, uh, John Maddox, uh, one of the editor, uh, related this, this the story uh, in the book 
Uh, and he said that there is a powerful school of thought chiefly represented by ed editors of journal, which holds that the scientific literature is and should be a passive mean of communication, a mirror held up to the face of research in which people other than its author can discover what is happening in laboratories the world over. But this, he said, is of course an idealization which is far from the truth. That is, journals simply don't record that, that publish paper that record faithfully what happened uh, in, in the laboratory, uh, but they actually define what is acceptable to be published as science in that particular journal and other journals uh, and many other Western journals for that matter. So there is a system of acceptance and what constitute acceptable way of, of doing research and writing research and publishing research. And of course, these uh, are familiar to, to those of us who work in an in institution and try to publish. Uh, we have to recognize these rules and be, be part of those rules. And we essentially need to conform to those rules that are made by uh, powerful individuals and institutions. Uh, in Nature, uh, last year also, uh, they did publish a number of uh, editorial and worldview uh, documenting the experiences of, uh, of scholars of colors. And, and here it is, uh, Professor Bumpus uh, talking about her own experience working in a university, a uh, well-known university in the US. Um, and she relates that part of the centering of whiteness in academia is that white faculty members are deemed the arbiters of the existence, validity, and impact of racism. Racism exists when white people say it does. As a result, racism is often disregarded and excused in academic institution at the expense of black people. And she is speaking from her own experience and many colleagues of mine could, could, could relate to this, uh, uh, to this experience very directly as well. Uh, now, of course, there are those who still continue to, to, to uh, argue against these kind of uh, uh, experience that they just don't see structural racism as being a problem. And some of you might have known about this incident with the Journal of, uh, uh, of the American Medical Association, of course, one of the most reputable journal uh, in the world. Uh, and they suspended their uh, editor-in-chief earlier this year uh, over a podcast in which basically he and the host uh, suggest that structural racism is an unfortunate term. And personally, he think that taking racism out of the conversation will help. Uh, and many of us who are of, of offended by the concept that we are racist. Now, of course, this is again, uh, as I said earlier, a difficult issue to discuss uh, often uh, because it tends to be polarizing. Uh, but I think one of the important things to remember is that when we talk about structural racism, uh, we're talking about uh, institutional practices. Uh, and I, I, I will offer a couple of definitions. There are many of them out there. I've just just extracted a couple of more recent ones. So in plain terms, structural racism shapes and affects the lives, well-being, and life chances of people of color. It normalizes historical, cultural, and institutional practices that benefit white people and disadvantage people of color. It also stealthily replicates the racial hierarchy established more than 400 years ago through slavery and colonialism placing white people at the top and black people at the bottom. Uh, another definition uh, in the context of understanding the structural determinants of health uh, uh, in the US in particular. Uh, all definitions, well, the authors uh, were referring to a number of other definitions of structural racism, but they said that all definitions make clear that racism is not simply the result of private prejudices held by individuals, but is also produced and reproduced by laws, rules, and practices, sanctioned and even implemented by various levels of government and embedded in the economic system, as well as in cultural and social norms. 
And so confronting racism requires not only changing individual attitudes, but also transforming and dismantling the policies and institutions that undergird the US racial hierarchy. Uh, and I would argue that these kind of hierarchies are embedded into a lot of the, uh, the system that we encounter, uh, whether it is metrics or whether it is university rankings, uh, these have all kind of uh, 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 structural biases that are built into them that favor one kind of uh, uh, institution, institutional practices over others. And at this point, it's, it's um, important to, again, differentiate what we meant by whiteness. Uh, and I find this uh, definition particularly useful. Uh, whiteness, like color and blackness, are essentially social constructs applied to human beings rather than veritable truths that have universal validity. The power of whiteness, however, is manifested by the ways in which racialized whiteness becomes transformed into social, political, economic, and cultural behavior. White culture, norms, and values in all these areas become normative, natural, they become the standards against which all other cultures, groups, and individuals are measured uh, and found to be inferior. Uh, Henry and Tater continue to, to uh, point out that whiteness is considered to be universal and allow ones to think and speak as if whiteness describe and define the world. Um, I took the liberty of taking out the word whiteness and substitute it with science. Uh, and this sentence reads uh, in parallels. The science is considered to be the universal and allow one to think and speak as if science described and defined the world. And of course, I'm talking about a particular view of science. There are many conceptions of science, but the particular form of science that have dominated uh, the world uh, through colonialism is the particular science that I'm referring to. And it is uh, an enforced and reproduced uh, with and by whiteness. Uh, and so I wanna then build on this argument about structural racism uh, is about the consolidation and reproduction of power. Uh, now, I've mentioned nature as one of the most powerful uh, institutions uh, in the world. Uh, and in recent years, it has been uh, reproducing itself differently. It's been spinning out different types of uh, journals based on its reputation. Uh, and this is not only nature that has been doing this. Nature has spun out the most number of, uh, of related journals. Uh, but there are other journals that are well-known, Cells and, and, uh, uh, and Lancet and so forth, they all spin out uh, sister journals, the derivative journals based on their, their nature brand or their different brand, the Cells brands and so forth. And these branding, of course, are one that many uh, uh, institutions sought after because these branding uh, and the publication in them allow them again to gain uh, rankings uh, recognition. And that become again, one of those powerful cycles of reinforcement. Uh, and nature of course, have been able to take advantage of this, uh, of this branding uh, to, to, to extract uh, uh, profits uh, based on those reputation uh, that they have inherited. And so, so they have actually been uh, pricing their, their journals according to uh, their degree of rejection. Uh, and so if you, if you <laughs> are willing to pay less or you have pay, pay more uh, and so forth, uh, you may get into a different tiers, right? And so uh, this kind of, uh, I suppose, in a way, uh, naked capitalism uh, is, is, is really, um, showing some other deeper root connections. And I would argue that I think, while on the one hand it's important to look at cost, uh, we have tended to pay too much attention to the cost itself. Uh, cost obviously is important when it comes to producing uh, research and publishing research, but there are lots of other invisible uh, and hidden uh, structure, structural barriers 
uh, that inhibit uh, other from taking part in uh, the knowledge making and sharing process other than cost, other than cost barrier. There are lots of other barrier. There are, there are political barrier, epistemic barrier, again, speaking the right language and talking in the right way and thinking in the same styles and so forth. And of course, there are lots of other uh, uh, technological uh, issues that are hidden, what I call standard settings, setting different kind of uh, uh, rules uh, that you have to follow. You must have this kind of things. You must have that. You must have DOI. You must have ORCID. You must have uh, a, a, a fair data principle. And all these kind of things are becoming invisible uh, standards that are, that are uh, advantaging some individuals and institutions by creating uh, new kind of barriers, but there are old structural barriers nonetheless. Uh, so I would argue that we have to pay more attention to these hidden barriers and not only about paywall uh, and permission barriers. There are lots of hidden problems that we need to address. And at this point, I want to, uh, 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 viewers, if you haven't seen this TED talk, uh, to go uh, uh, to listen to it afterward. Uh, and this TED talk has been very well viewed over the years. Uh, the Nigerian novelist uh, Chimamanda Adichie uh, in this debut TED talk talk about the danger of a single story. And she said it is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. Uh, and there is a word in, in Igbo, her language, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world. And it is Konankali. It is a noun that loosely translates to be greater than other. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of Nankali, how they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. She goes on to say that power is its ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Morit Bokhati writes that if you want to dispossess the people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with, secondly, start with the story with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British, and you have an entirely different story. But if you start with the story of the failure of the African state and not with the colonial creation of the African state, uh, and you will have an entirely different story. Uh, and so we have not heard these other stories. We have heard a lot of singular stories of the triumph of the West and how the West became prosperous because they had come to discover science uh, and all kinds of innovations. Uh, and uh, we, we seldom hear about uh, how, uh, how, um, how Europe uh, in this case, underdeveloped Africa, and this well-known, well, now increasingly well-known book by Walter Rodney, written in the 1970s, that clearly shows how, uh, how uh, certain European powers systematically uh, underdeveloped uh, many uh, colonial uh, countries uh, uh, throughout Africa. Uh, and recently, uh, Shashi Tandor wrote a book about, uh, again, the, the occupation of, of, um, of India by, by Britain. Uh, and he re reminded us that Britain came to one of the richest countries in the world and reduced it after 200 years of plunder to one of the poorest. And so if we look at the contemporary situation of the countries and we say, well, it's, they're poor because they, they lack certain infrastructures, they're poor because they have no capacity to do science, they're poor because they lack education of higher education and the kind of thing. Uh, and, and we have to ask ourselves why uh, these things are missing in the first place and how they're systematically created that way over uh, the, uh, the colonial period. Uh, and we'll, we'll get a very different story. If we rewind the clock 250, 300 years, we see the world very differently if we were to, if we were to let it replay uh, without these kind of structural uh, uh, domination. Um, I want to conclude by sharing some of my own understanding working with colleagues who have been publishing journals from across 
uh, the Global South. These are some of the journals that I've been working with. Uh, and they've been publishing for, for, for many decades now. Uh, the journal, uh, African Journal of Food and Nutrition Development uh, is, and the African Health Sciences Journal just celebrated its 10th, 20th anniversary. And Professor James Tawini recently gave a keynote at OASPA. Some of you might have heard uh, about why he started his journals and using his journal as a way to build uh, their own understanding of local health uh, and and uh, and why he started the journal in terms of uh, the lack of of interest uh, of uh, health in those in the, that part of the world uh, by Western journals, uh, but both Professor Tawini and and Dr. Ruth Moyango uh, reminded me that the reason they also were so dedicated to their journal is because. They reminded me the importance of, of uh, the journal uh, as a village. They both independently described to me how they see the journal as a village, one that takes many, many people uh, uh, to make it work. Uh, many people who play different roles uh, in addition to the researchers uh, themselves. And that the notion of a village uh, is one that have always stuck with me because when I was in graduate school, that was still very much the ethos of what a journal is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a community. It's supposed to be a place where we share and learn from each other. Uh, but unfortunately, a journal has been turned into profit centers, uh, and we don't even know who runs those journals most of the time. We just hope to have journal will get in there because they will buy us credit and reputation is no longer about building relationships and citation is nothing but a set of currency now uh, is not really about human relationships is more about kind of transactions that could be turned into other kind of capitals. Uh, and so I want to leave with understanding about the importance of of being in a village, a sense of belonging, a sense of identity uh, as scholars that we all need these kind of communities with us uh, and for us. Uh, and so if we think about open access, to me, it's really about opening the world of knowledge with community uh, and learn from communities. And I've, I've learned so much over the years working with, with grassroots organizations, more so than I do from, uh, from the institution of higher learning. Because as my colleagues always say, 90% of the world knowledge are embedded in communities. Uh, only a very small percentage of knowledge are actually codified in formal institution. So we only look at what's published uh, uh, and published in certain type of journals. We're missing the majority of the world's knowledge uh, to our own detriment. And so when we think about uh, uh, opening up science, opening up research, it's really about opening up with communities and thinking about solidarity across different kinds of communities, not just research communities. Uh, and this is the kind of, of, of spaces that I would love to see. And in recent years, there have been more understanding about the need to, to understand indigenous ways of knowing the principles uh, and the respect for the different way of, of, of uh, understanding and, and and working with each other. And the kind of extractionist approach that we have been accustomed to, researchers going into the community, taking the data and publishing and benefiting from that. Meanwhile, the communities that are affected are not uh, receiving any benefit. Uh, uh, those are the kind of extractive and unethical research uh, that ought to be uh, ought to be rethought seriously uh, as a structural problem. Uh, and we can learn from our indigenous communities, colleagues, and scholars about how to respect each other's uh, way of knowing uh, and to enrich each other's ways of knowing. And, and the particular set of principle I want to point you to, if you haven't seen it, is the notion of care data. That is thinking about uh, data not only as uh, open is always good, but has to respect what it is that the community uh, like to share with the researchers and what kind of collective benefits would result as a result of, of sharing data uh, and what kind of control and authorities do they have, the community have over the data 
uh, uh, extracted from them uh, and what kind of responsibility and ethics uh, the researchers have to think about uh, in these process of data sharing. And these are the kind of issues that uh, we need to think more about if we wanna rebuild a fair and equitable system. Uh, and this, uh, these, these, by the way, these, uh, these diagrams or these images uh, were made in a, in a zine with my colleagues. Um, uh, um, and you can see the name here, I wanna shout out to them. Uh, Danielle uh, Cooper, Emily Drabinsky, Lisa Hankley, Jojo Carlin, and, and Ella Prospilo. Uh, in 2019, at the Triangle uh, Scholarly Communication uh, 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 Institute, uh, we had several days together. Uh, thanks to the Institute, we we're able to put together this scene. And you can go through the link there and download it if you're interested. Uh, and if you share our vision, and this is the kind of world we're hoping to see, and that's the whole kind of world that uh, more and more of us, I hope, are working towards. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to say thank you and to see if you have any questions. Thank you, Leslie. Wonderful presentation. Yes, we do have one question thus far in the Q&A, and it's from Joe Havman. When talking about standards and workflows, aren't persistent identifiers like ORCID and DOIs also enablers of equity once embraced? Well, so, so it is 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 a question of have and have not, right? So whenever you have uh, a technology like an identifiers, you basically create create a world of have and have not. Uh, and so uh, so if you become the have not, you want to become part of the the in crowd. And so the question is then who is in control of the in crowd, and who what do they gain, stand to gain? And what do those outside stand to lose? And I think every time we see a new technology, we have to think about the network effects, the other side of the network. Uh, and so if you're, you know, insurance schemes for health is great if you're part of the insurance scheme, but what if you're not part of that scheme? And that's, we also have to think about. Thank you, Leslie. I think we... Oh, there was a comment in here um, by Simon. Just wanted to comment on what a brilliant and thoughtful presentation this was. Well, thank, thank you very her. much, Simon. Right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Folks, if we have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A. Well, while we wait for that, I actually, uh, it's more of a, I, I'm not sure if, you know, if there's an answer to this quite yet. Um, when we, we talk about the, the manner in which we are expected to produce scholarly materials and what you're suggesting, I think many are, um, the format, different formats need to be embraced. How do we change that mentality of following this particular prescriptive way of generating this, yeah. this format? Uh, can you offer some suggestions, insights? Well, again, I think the, the kind of homogenization that we've seen over the years uh, has been artificially created, right? I mean, even when I was starting graduate school, uh, a few decades ago, uh, there were a lot more flexibility in terms of the kind of way you can write, right? Uh, and now you have to write in a certain way only. If you don't follow even the format, you're not going to get in. Uh, and, and so, and if you don't come up with the right keywords that kind of hit the kind of uh, uh, indexing system, you're not going to get in, that kind of thing. So we have to kind of play by the rule that is set by the publishing uh, power, right? And this is where I keep saying, that's why, why concentration is dangerous. It's not that they set prices, it's because they set the rules by which we operate. And the more concentration we see, the more 
we become more homogenized. And these are well documented in every industry, including scholarly communications. So, so I would say that we need to have more grassroots initiative that are recognized or regional initiative that are recognized, right? We have huge system of publishings in Latin America already that are very distinct from that of North America. We don't respect that, right? And, th and so uh, we need to learn from our colleagues in Latin America and our colleagues, many of them I mentioned in, in across African countries, in South Asia and in, uh, across Asia, uh, there are different ways of, of practicing, but they're also, if they've been told that if they want to become world class, they have to play by these set of rules, right? And so, so we have to dismantle this idea of world class because, as I argue, it is very much a colonial legacy, uh, and we know we should we should we should challenge these kind of things. Uh, and if you go back, in fact, to the 1800s, uh, when science start become become formalized. You still have lots of different outlets, you know. I love—I mean, I studied Charles Darwin a lot in grad school, and he published in all kinds of places. And in fact, he—he he didn't want to publish in journals because they think he thought it was too restricting, right? He loves to write books, you know. His book, *The Origin of Species*, he calls one long argument, right? And 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 so uh, somehow that the, the the powerful institution have decided, you know, that certain formats are the one to be to be codified. And I would argue that again, that has a lot to do with industrialization and mass production of, uh, of, of, of uh, research products uh, as commodities, right? Uh, in order to really go through the supply chain more easily, you standardize a lot of things. You standardize submission, you standardize peer review, you standardize indexing, uh, and so you can put it through a uniform production line much more easily uh, by machine, by machine indexings, and of course, increasingly algorithmic uh, uh, classifications and, and, uh, uh, and channeling. Uh, so I say, yes, we have to resist these kind of standards that are imposed uh, by uh, those powerful entities that are increasingly concentrating the way we we think and do research and share research great thank you leslie we have two more questions and a little under five minutes left so i'll start with the first one from jim are there new models of institution that might avoid the albeit inadvertent creation of structural inequities in the future yeah so um we have to begin by thinking about the way we, again, we value uh, um, uh, um, uh, academic labors and so forth, right? So uh, we have increasingly narrow sets of way we think about uh, what's, what's the productive academics, right? And so uh, if you look around uh, the world and, and often uh, I see brilliant colleagues who struggle in our, in our current system because they don't fit into that mold of the publish and perish, right? And so we, we already have lots of talented folks in our system. Let them flourish, find way to let each other flourish, find way to, for us to support each other as a community rather than as competitors uh, against each other. Uh, and so, so we already have within our community many, many, like I said, smart people, caring people. Uh, and we just let, we need to have the political will, the leadership to say, you know, let's let, let's let everybody flourish uh, and bring each other up. And so, yeah, so, so there are lots of innovative things happening, right? Um, if I let my students submit assignments in different format, you know, in poetries, in raps, in, 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 in songs, in storytelling, rather than the essay, the student comes up with some amazing things, right? But over time, we, we, tell, we train them into narrower and narrower uh, uh, thinkers, right? We restrict their creativity. And I think institutions have always done that, restrict our creativity. It's time to, to let our creativity collectively flourish. Great, thank you. The next question, uh, what about forms of racism between white communities? Is, 
Is this been studied? Not all white people are Anglo-Saxons. Thanks for the talk. So rich in pointers to further reflections. Well, one of the quote that I, I share, uh, again, about whiteness, um, is, again, whiteness is not about skin color, right? Whiteness is about a particular set of norms that become codified, but often because they're codified by white people to start, uh, that the, the term whiteness is really referred to the set of those, those norms and, and hegemonic uh, system of, of governance. Uh, and so you can be non-white and, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, and exercise whiteness, right? And in fact, I would say personally through graduate school, I was trained to be white. Uh, and in fact, I learned a derogatory term about me or about Asians in particular, we're called bananas. Bananas, there is yellow on the outside, but white on the inside because we're all so keen on becoming white in terms of being part of the establishment, right? And so through, throughout grad school, I never thought about other things than being part of the institution, how to fit in, right? How to be white. And so, so whiteness is not about about skin color is again, a set of, of norms that become structuring. Right. We and have so yeah, so whiteness can be against other white. And in fact, if you go back in history, white racism start with the enclosures of their own, you know, if you think about the enclosure movement in the UK, it was first on the far, on the on the farmers themselves, you know, and then once they have exhausted that, they go out somewhere else and and extract other people. Right. Um, Great. We have one minute left, Leslie. We have one more question, uh, a follow up to your nature article. Nature article um, comment. Are you aware of any concrete actions that the Nature Public Publishing Group have taken to implement what they proclaimed? they would do um, better but well, good question i have written them and i've been you know looking through their 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 the publication they do publish as i said more uh editorials and worldviews that kind of thing uh as there are many other uh journals uh, um and, and so um we'll, we'll see exactly what they're doing in terms of actions great and if you know about it i would love to learn about it <laughs> Leslie, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. We are at the top of the hour and um, really appreciate you, what you've, you've, you've presented here today. And we are off now to the next one, but hopefully uh, you